Over the past few years, we have learned that a very important stake, a group of very important stakeholders are parents. So because of that, we have decided to have dedicated talks for parents. Um, and then we found that one talk is not enough. So last year, we were bursting out of the scenes from one room that they gave us, and I think they overdid it this year. Right? Put me in this giant LT, two slots. Okay. So what I'm going to do is, I assume that most of you would have come to the NUS Open House where either Brenda Yeo, who is the Dean of the Faculty, or myself have given talks, and by now you are in a better position because you have an offer in hand, or your child has an offer in hand. And it becomes a very critical moment for you up to June 1st because most of the kids who make it to FASS would have made it to any other university. because. Um, FASS has maintained uh, a very high profile, right? So, knowing that you have choices, that your, your, your child has choices, um, we thought that it would be fair to give you a little bit more detail about what a education at FASS Arts would require and entail, and then you will be in a better position to compare with the alternatives that you may want to you know, consider at this point and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have after. So let me just go through essentially you know, the same bubbles that we used uh, at Open House Talk. Uh, question would be why would any, you know, how would you choose a university? Right? Um, in terms of ranking, is it important now that's a very difficult question when you ask an academic in the Faculty of Arts. We're supposed to be liberal, we're supposed to be broad-based, we're supposed to not care about these things, right? So if you talk to us, uh, most of us will say, well, we don't really care that much. Half my colleagues don't even know about these rankings. We're all in their little world with their very important research, their students and all that. So rankings are, you know, not really incidental. But of course, if we do well, it's good. But more seriously though, I think for the students, it is critical, right? Because they will carry the degree, the hallmark, the mark of the degree for the rest of their careers. For many of our students in FASS, after they leave here, um, they either venture off into institutions where, you know, degrees matter, or they go on to further education. In which case, where you came from is very important because it secures scholarships and funding for graduate funding. So so far, we, you would have seen that. The QS ranking came out just recently, and overall, I mean, several pieces of good news. Of course, the university does very well. Right? NUS has been really moving forward on this, and we ride on the good reputation of NUS. So that's the first good reason for coming to FASS, because we are at NUS. Right? NUS has been doing very, very well internationally. Second, when ranking comes down, to the subject specific, we're also pleased to note that the faculty has been doing very well. So that's good news. I mean, it's good news for us because it affirms that the curriculum that we have developed and the kind of training that we prioritize for our students has, we're doing the right thing. So it affirms us, right, so that we can continue to pursue this. Um, sorry, how, now this is the specific rankings for each subject which you may be interested in. Uh, communications has hot, you know, the news headlines because they came out fourth in the world. So the rest of us who were not fourth in the world stared at them and said, how did you make it? <laughs> how come you're fourth and we're not fourth yet? But they're doing very well. They outrank the Wee Kim Wee School, which is a very, very good school. Right? So um, kudos to them. Um, all in, if you look at the subjects that uh, we showcase today, and I hope you have a chance to attend some talks and go around the booth, and, and my colleagues are all you know, manning them. All in, I think we do pretty good. Geography has always been um, blazing you know, ahead. Now they are eighth in the world. Sociology has done too badly, the 14th. Philosophy and etc. You can see the whole list, right? Of course, in Asia, I mean, it's not. Uh, we, we, we are ranked very well in Asia. So, these rankings help 
I, I guess, well, just now I said for two reasons, probably for three reasons. The first reason would be just, you know, having that reputation that carries, you carry along with it for the rest of your life after you graduate from here. The second reason, the benefits happen right here. Um, when we rank well, there are two good outcomes for our students. First, when we rank well, we suddenly are the flavor of the month. And top universities globally all come to us to want to forge partnerships, right? They forge partnerships um, for student exchange. So because of that, it also creates a lot more opportunities for art students to go overseas for one semester or one year. And that's very, very good news for us. We have not always been in this kind of good position, but we have been riding on, 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 on goodwill for the past, I think, at least five years. So we've been very busy. So like, for example, this year, there's so many calls for us to go visit the different institutions and meetings so that we can sign agreements, right? And so that we can potentially talk about, you know, joint degrees, more joint degrees and joint minors and so forth. The third benefit from having a good ranking translates to the classroom as well. And that is, we become a very hot destination for people who are doing well in these areas, in terms of the teaching staff. So when we hire now, we have to do a international search, right? I mean, that, that is the business of the university, right? We cast our wide, very wide, so that we can attract the best in the field to come to NUS to teach our students. When we, are, when we recruit at the faculty, we're very, very careful that we don't recruit only people who are esteemed in research. In fact, the criteria is very stringent. When we recruit, they have to give a talk to the students. So they give a talk to the faculty and graduate students, and everybody has a form to evaluate them, you know, to give feedback. And then they have to give a lesson to an undergraduate class. And the undergraduate students will give us feedback. And the reason they won't be able to survive here is they are not good teachers. Right? NUS is very, very strict about that. You may be very, very good in your research, but if you can't translate that and convey that to our students, it will be very hard for that person to survive here. Right? So, in the past few years, sociology has been recruiting very aggressively because we are expanding so fast, and, and we've got such good quality people applying. And um, it benefits our students at the end of the day because then these colleagues, especially the young upcoming assistant professors, they have exciting research programs and when they come into the classroom, two things happen. Students get up-to-date information and knowledge because they are being taught by active researchers. And second, because we are doing you know, good research, we also have research opportunities for students. So um, my, my research team, for example, is it comprises of majority undergraduate students who are working for me either part-time or as part of a module, right? And they get to do research with us and they get a flavor of what it is to do, you know, uh, scientific, you know, social science research. And some of them may aspire to become academics. The difference between FASS and the other faculties, um, so right now, I don't have to talk about the other NUS faculties because we, you, you only get one offer, right? So you, you would have gotten the FASS one. So let's say if you compare it right now to SMU, to NTU, very unlikely to SUTD, right? Because we're like different, you know, different spectrums of the interest span, um, or to an overseas university. One of the things that we stand out on is because we are so big, we are the largest faculty on NUS campus and certainly larger than any of the other faculties uh, in the local universities. Um, because we are so large, we can afford to offer a huge variety. Right? So let's talk about that. Um, when you come to FASS, we tell the students that they should actually just focus on one single major because that, that is what the curriculum was designed for, right? If you do one major, you will spend 50% of your time 
in that nature, and the other 50% of the time, you're forced to take modules outside of your major. This is a sore point with our students because once they find a major they love, by love usually because they do well, right? they don't want to do anything else, right? So they want to do you know, nothing but psychology, nothing but you know, history. And we say, no, that will not make you a good thinker. Because in, in the real world now, you know, it takes a multidisciplinary perspective to solve real problems. So we recommend a single major. But as you know, we take in 1,500 students every year. This is mandated by MOE, right? and we're very happy to welcome them. So this 1,500, they're so diverse you know, in, in the aspirations, their capabilities, their values, and so forth. And over time, we've learned to listen to our students, and they've told us things like, oh, we're not happy with one major, because the other 50% of the time, like Rojak, you, know, you say, take whatever you want, but I don't know what I want. So it's, life is very difficult for me. So it's okay, then what will make it easier? They said, how about if you make sense of the other 50% for me? Like in a minor. So I said, fine, we'll roll out minors for you. So a, a, a very common aspiration when you talk to students is they'll tell you they're doing one major and one minor. And then the diehards will come to us and say, I am so in love with my psychology and social work. So I want to do two major. Of course, we'll say, why? Both are in social science. It doesn't benefit you. But then when they say things like, but if I want to be a social worker and I major in psychology, it will make me a better social worker. Now, how can you say no to a child like that? So we allow them to do two majors if they choose to. But then we also say, if you're going to do two majors, why don't you make good use of that second major or minor? Take it outside of art. So in those combis, like major, minor, double major, the second option the minor or the second major, we do encourage students to look beyond art. And that's the beauty of being in NUS, right? That you, have, you can count on the other faculties. Um, then the more serious one would say, I want to do a double degree. We say, all right, we have platforms for that. Or a joint degree. The joint degree is a little bit more attractive for us because it allows the student usually to go overseas. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a while. Okay? Now, in terms of choice, not only do the students have choice in how they package the curriculum, major, major, minor, double major, etc. They have choice in terms of where they want to place their anchor. Right? You, you, we have to run an FASS open house because we cannot convey all this information you know, meaningfully to you in a short talk. So not you know, a few years ago we decided that rather than talk and talk and talk and everybody just stares and tries to believe us, they need to see the majors for themselves. So that's why today, every single department is on showcase. Right? Um, they are the, each booth is uh, populated by academic staff, admin staff, and then of course all our die-hard students, you know, who are exams just, come, just over a week ago, so they're very happy now. Results coming out in a few weeks, maybe some of them won't be so happy then. But look, today they're all happy. Eh? We have 17 departments. I lose count because every, every few years, you know, with something new, we have a lot of faculty members who get along with each other. So that's very important, right? So I have 400 colleagues. Um, these are the PhDs. Okay? And we have every semester, just arts alone, FASS alone, runs 250 modules minimum. So one of the reasons why I've grown so much white hair is because every semester we have to fight with the registrar. Why? Because the registrar says, I have limited capacity. How come art needs so many exam values, so many lectures, you know, lecture theatres and so forth? Because, because we run 250 modules on average every semester. So this means that for our art students, there's tremendous choice. The most difficult task for a first year student in their first semester is of all these wonderful modules and we force them to sit down for two days just to listen to everybody selling their department, of all these wonderful options they have, they're only allowed to read five modules. Okay? So that choice is a very difficult one for many of our students and many of them try to overload so we also put a gate to that because we know that overloading is not good. Right? So, Sometimes they take six, we allow them to do that because everything is done online because we want to empower the students to make these decisions as and when they feel the need. So we give them a choice. Between four to six modules is a regular workload. 
Anything less than four, I need to see them because something may not be right. Anything more than six, these are the overachievers, right? We also need to see them to make sure that they can manage it. And if they, we think that they can, we do allow students to do that. But nonetheless, okay, a lot of modules to choose from. In addition to choosing us modules, the university, our, the, the FASS curriculum requires that our students leave the faculty for one semester. So they will have to take five modules from outside their major, outside the faculty. And I think this is a good thing, but of course if you talk to the students, they may not say so, because they, they have to take the bus. You know, it's not, not very convenient sometimes. So we're working on the transportation, right? To make sure that we can bus students from business to science to engineering to U town and so forth. But students manage, right? So many of the, our students would have good friends, you know, from other faculties because they learn in the same classroom. The faculty looks like, you know, sometimes if you think, look at how much we offer, it's a bit messy, isn't it? But if you, you know, take a more macro view of it, you'll see that we are organized uh, into three main pillars. Right? This is the faculty of arts, so of course we have a very good humanities program. Right? The humanities program is the center pillar. The social science program is the most, it's the largest because it has all the sexy new disciplines. Right, so that's the second pillar. Now the third pillar, which I personally feel is the most important pillar, is the division of social science, uh, so Asian studies. Why? Because for your, my, my son is coming to SASS, right? So for, for our children, in their career, very likely, they will, Asia will become, you know, where it's happening, you know, the platform where new, opportunities will emerge, where problems will be concentrated, etc. So therefore, for them to have a relevant career, they must be able to take advantage of the fact that they know Asia. Now, this is here in life lies the contradiction. So our kids, uh, most of them are local, right? You know, come, coming from our own system and all that. Sadly, very few know Asia well, because after if you live in Asia, why do you need to know Asia? I'd rather know more about the US and Australia, Europe and so forth. So we're trying to get our students to be a little bit more adventurous, right? not to look towards the US, UK, Europe and all, all the time, but also keep an eye on Asia because they don't want to miss the boat. They want to, don't want to miss the opportunities that will arise, be, you know, be it in business, politics, governance and so forth. Right? So I think the division of Asian studies is probably the one division that you, know, you should pay attention to. So please go to some of their talks. Now, in addition to that, then we have all these other programs that don't quite belong here or there because the happening thing now is to cross-discipline. Right? If you're just a sociology graduate, your worldview may be a little bit myopic because you will only see things from a sociological perspective. So we believe that to train the students well, they really need to have a broad-based curriculum where it's multidisciplinary. So we already do that in the curriculum, right? We say that major is only 50%, the other 50% is not in your major. But we feel that that's not sufficient because one complaint from students is, you know, I take a module in political science, I take a module in economics, I take a module in English, but nobody is helping me make sense of all these different modules. So we say that's a good point. So therefore, we are putting a lot of effort in, in mainstreaming multidisciplinary majors and minors. So we have a whole office, you know, that looks after that, and we that office is staffed by, uh, is looked after by an assistant dean. He's moving around somewhere downstairs. So please have a chance if you have a chance, attend the uh, talk that's given by his his division. And we have a very strong and very uh, large language center, the Center for Language Studies. I think right now is. Is it 12 or 14 languages and growing by the year? So it's very exciting. Now, this is Division of Asian Studies. Chinese Studies, Japanese Studies, Malay, Southeast Asian, South Asian. Um, probably, I don't know whether the building will come up in time for our children, but there will be a new Asian Studies program. Uh, we just saw the blueprints yesterday, tendered already, so they will start construction in an old admin block that will not be used anymore and Asian studies will be right there. Hopefully it will be ready by the time they are in their third year or so. Humanities, 
ELL has three majors, language, literature and theatre studies, and history, philosophy. This, this is um, the biggest division, communications, econs, geography, political science, psychology, social work, sociology. Now, here is our new baby, Global Studies. And I told you that and as we were reviewing, we were going into curriculum review for the past two years. Um, this is so something that I was overseeing. The two things we wanted to look at, the first was the faculty requirements, right? But then the second, which after discussion we realized that that should come first, is to come up with a major that is to keep up with the time. What is the most relevant major now? And for you know, students who are in broad-based liberal arts programs, okay? and that was global studies. So we we were approached by several of top universities in the U.S. who are our partners, you know, to request that NUS FASS consider setting up a global studies major so that we can start uh, joint degree endeavors with them. And we reviewed the proposal. We thought this was a very good idea. So we worked on the global studies major for the past. I think about one and a half years or so, and we got that passed uh, by the university in December, and this will be a brand new major if your child is coming in in August. Right? Um, there will be a talk by the convener, Janice, so if you have a chance, you know, please go listen to her. European studies has been around for many, many, many years, ever since I was a student here, and they continue to attract those who are very keen on, Asia, uh, on Europe. So now that with the European Union, all kinds of things happening with the European Union, right? every other day there's headlines about the Euro, etc., etc. So there's renewed interest from our students. Uh, is a very, you know, for global studies and, and European studies, language is a compulsory component. Right? So especially if the students are very into language, this is, these are good programs for them. What kind of languages do we offer? So far, almost everything that we can think of that is you know, popular and where there is a, a, a strong demand. Right? Uh, the, I think uh, in the next couple of years, I believe there are plans to mainstream <coughs> more, more ads to this. But for now, this is what we have. I can tell you that the most popular is Korean. Not because they are dying to study the tension between North and South Korea, was because of K-pop, psych, and for us, Korean dramas. So the standing joke, of course, is when we approve Korean, all of us are so excited, you know, with vested interest. So I was whispering to everyone, I'm going to, I'm going to audit the class, right, since I love Korean drama. I couldn't even get into the room because the students were, the students were so into it. So it's, 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 it's a very, very hot language. Now, I talked about minors a little while ago. You know, every discipline offers a minor, right? So I'm, I'm not going to talk about that because I find those very boring. I mean, if you're going to major in sociology and minor in history, you know, I, I, I find, I mean, of course students do that and we say, sure, we endorse you. But to me, that other 50% of the curriculum when we planned it was for cross-disciplinary training, isn't it? So if you're going to focus on another discipline, it's, it's such a waste, I feel. But nonetheless, you know, every, you know, we feel that we should tailor the curric allow students to tailor their own curriculum because we are very mindful of the fact that this is the beginning of the student's life as an adult. So they've been prescribed enough all the way up to JC, even the polys and IB, right? So when they come to FASS, we don't want to prescribe because we want them, we want to empower them to make decisions that will speak to their interests, their aspirations, and their capabilities. So for that reason, it makes life a lot more difficult for a typical art student. If you go to engineering, for example, you don't have to think too much because everything is pre-allocated for you, right? You have to follow the building block because of the nature of the discipline. When you come to arts, there's very few compulsory modules. We just have baskets of modules, right, where you choose. So choice becomes a big thing. So I think the journey through an arts curriculum at NUS grows the student not just in terms of content familiarity, but also in terms of their leadership, independence, and EQ. Because from day one, they know that they cannot survive on their own because they need to find out things. They need to be able to talk to people, find friends, get to know the lecturers, the admin staff, because all the time there's so much things to find out. And then 
they realize that after a while, after especially the compulsory orientation talk, there's nothing compulsory really. I mean, the talk itself. Then it becomes this whole, you know, the first day I get like ton loads of emails from these poor students who say, I'm so confused. And we say, that's all right. And I say, well, I'm so confused. I don't know what to take. It's okay. You know, just pray about it, right? Somehow, you know, there's room to make mistakes. It's okay. You take a module now and then you go, you know, you find out that, oh my goodness, it's terrible. I hate it. That, that, it's okay. You just have to pass it and make sure you do well. And then you can drop it, you know, after, after you're done. So there's a lot of choices involved, right? And we want them to make this kind of decision because we believe that, first of all, if they make the decision and if they decide, they passionately argue for their path, they will do well. Because we want to keep them engaged. Because now they're, 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 we can't scold them anymore, you know? I mean, in JC, you still have detention and all that, right? Once they come to us, there's no more detention, we can't scold them. If they come, okay, I can tell you now, if they don't come to class, there's nothing we can do about this. I can't call you. I, know, I can't talk to you anymore after today. You know why? Because once your student, your child matriculates, my contract is with your child and not with you. So you can call me and say, I want to find out about my child. Has he been attending classes? I will say, I'm sorry. Can you come and see me with your child? All right? Because we cannot give out information about the student. And that's of course, you know, there's danger cases and all that, right? But generally that's the culture that we have at FASS. Because our contract is with the undergraduate and we work with them. Some of them may not be prepared yet because the maturity level is not quite there, but that's okay. They are with us for three to four years, we will grow them, right? So that by the time they are done, they will be in control of their destiny. So it starts with the curriculum. It starts with making a choice, which major do I want to do? And it starts with, do I want to do a major and, and then free flow or a major, a minor, whatever? And these are decisions that we don't prescribe. Right? We just say, these are the options, you choose what is good for you. If, if you have an option that we don't mainstream, you just come see us, we will try to make it work. And we have very, you know, quite a lot, depending on our students' needs. So one of the things that we have come up with to help students who need to package their, their, their education is multidisciplinary minors. Right? Because multidisciplinary minors are exciting. So my, my own area is in health, I do health research, right? and, I'm, and I'm a sociologist. But I know that I have to work with my psychology friends, health economists, political scientists, and so forth to, to have a better understanding of how we can tackle you know, the aging concerns, healthcare costs, rising healthcare costs, and so forth. <coughs> so with that kind of background, we came up with a multidisciplinary minor so in health studies, the health and social science. You see somewhere, I don't know how to use it, somewhere there, okay, health and social science. And this is a new minor that we have mainstreamed uh, in collaboration with the Sosui Hot School of Public Policy, uh, no, the Sosui Hot School of Public Health, right? So through these multidisciplinary minors, students would get to, to to understand a thematic area. So in this case, health from different disciplines, and we package that all together into a minor. And minor is only six modules. A major for a three-year program is fifteen modules. So a minor is very manageable, right? So I talked about the health. Minor, I talked about global studies. We also have a minor in film studies. So if you like watching movies, you will love the minor because this is you know, the best of the ELL, uh, the uh, English language and literature colleagues who came together to mainstream a minor in film studies to uh, bring uh, academic discourse into film, filmmaking and the method, and films as, as, a, as a platform you know, for social agency. The geographers have come up with, now this one I don't, I, minor in petroleum exploration. Sounds like you can make a lot of money from it. You go find out more, I know very little about it. I know that, you know, it's, it's, uh, the, the, the physical geographers, geographers are very excited about it. And, and I understand it's a very good minor. Hmm, okay. Are we good? I think we are very good. All right. Not just because we have good colleagues, not just because we have good students. I mean, if you come to FASS, I've been teaching here for a long time because I was a student here when I was an undergraduate. But one of the reasons why I love my job is because of my students. We have fantastic students. I tell you, art students are they are remarkable. They they have so they have so little discipline problems. 
because they are all so mature and they are so, all so very bright, very respectful and very keen right, to push forward. So students aside, staff aside, I think for you, right, what will be exciting about any university program would be the curriculum. It has to be. Right? The curriculum is the contract that we sign with you because in the next three to four years, we will, we will commit ourselves to growing the student along these lines. So for FASS, the curriculum has two equally important dimensions. Debt, because you have to have debt in an area because that's where your passion is. Right? If you take a few modules here, a few modules here, at the end of the day, really, you know, then what, what, you, you can't really claim you know, to know something well. Right? So we feel that that is not good. So therefore, our major continues to be fairly significant. And um, as I said, 50% of a three-year program and 60% for a four-year program. Because the fourth year, the honours year, is all major training, nothing else. Okay? So you shouldn't do honours if you don't like your major. That's important. But we also know that the new economy requires broad-based appreciation. So the breadth requirement is important. For the breadth requirement, we invoke three elements. First, the university level requirement. So this requires the students to go outside of the faculty to take modules from science, engineering, architecture, and so on. Right? Then, within the faculty, we have our own requirements because we say that you know the faculty has three strengths, three pillars: Asian studies, humanities, and social science. Therefore, if you are an arts graduate, you must surely know something about Asian studies, something about humanities, and something something about social science, right? So, faculty requirements require the students to take at least one module in each of the three divisions, and then you know you always must give students choice. So that third bracket, the unrestricted elective, is what they can play with. There are seven modules in that basket. In that basket, they can do anything they want, except do more major. Okay? So they can collect a minor, start a second major, go outside the faculty, whatever, whatever. So that's, that's the student's favorite basket. Now, when you have a double degree option, I think a lot of times, Students are excited because they think it's prestigious, right? But I would uh, prefer to pitch it as, you know, appealing to students who have diverse interests and who are very, very sure that they can manage the overload, okay? So we have several double degree options. Um, some of your, 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 ch your, your, your children may already have been accepted into them. Um, if they have not, there's always a second chance. So by the end of their first year, if they have demonstrated you know, that they are able to take on a second degree, then they can come and see me and we will help them. Uh, in addition to those that are structured, we also tailor them for students with different <coughs> needs. Right? So that's the kind of flexibility that we are proud of and we try to, to be as flexible as possible because we know that students have different needs. Now the JDPs, uh, I think, are more appealing to students and, and parents as well because for parents, they, I asked my child, you know, my, my son, you know, when he, he, he completed and he was applying, I mean, of course, I didn't want him to say yes, but I did ask him, would you prefer to go overseas? And thank goodness, see, this is the power of socialization, right? When he was growing up, every open house I'll bring him and then he gets so familiar with art that he goes, no, I want to come to art. So I said, great! Okay, but for you, maybe not so lucky, your child wants to go overseas, right? So then for parents, you know, I was thinking of, oh, my child wants to go overseas. So for, I already prayed for two years, right, for NS. Every day I had to go on my knees to pray, because so worried what will happen to him in NS. And then if he's going to go overseas for another three to four years, oh my goodness, I'll be praying for a long time. So if your child is in that position, I think from a parent's perspective, we prefer them to be here at least in the undergraduate part. No? Uh, graduates they are older, then they can go for a graduate program overseas, that's great. But we also know that going overseas has, has strong merits because it takes the child out of the comfort zone, right? And they learn to be a lot more independent and appreciative right, of what Singapore can offer and, and then they bring the best of both worlds back. So we try to mainstream this as part of an FASS experience. 
The most extreme form of overseas partnership would be these joint degree endeavours that we have with top universities, our partners overseas. Right? So the one that, you know, uh, that's unique to FASS is the UNC, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, one of the top public universities in North America. And if, you're, if the students are majoring in econs, literature, geography, history and political science, they are able to consider a JDP with UNC, which means they spend, they start here, then they go to UNC for one year, and then they come back here. And the UNC kids do the same. They start at UNC, come here for one year, and then go back to UNC, and they get one degree but two credits from NUS and from UNC. Um, then we also have a very, I think it's a very tough program, actuarial studies and economics, uh, but it's a very popular program and very successful program. We also have uh, a JDP with ANU if you are with the USP, right, if you do literature, history, philosophy and theatre studies. Waseda University is another uh, popular destination because of Japanese pop culture and so we also have a JDP with Waseda. Now, if you don't want to do a JDP, there are many other opportunities that will bring you overseas. Student exchange programs, field studies and immersion programs, you know, for example the language modules, as well as summer schools. So where can, your, when, where can an art student go? Well, practically every top university in the world. Right? We have agreements with all of them and um, we try to push as many students out as possible. So they go for one semester and they come back much richer because of the experience. Okay? So does it cost a lot more? Well, the student will have to pay for the air ticket and the cost of living expenses, but the fees are the same. So they pay fees only to NUS, right? and that works very well for our students. Sorry. Now, something that I want to talk about a little bit more, because there is still an opportunity for your child if they are coming into FASS now, I believe we are quite gung-ho about allowing them to start with the summer school. Right? So this is something that you can talk to me about a little bit more if you think that your child will be interested. And this is Fast Track Asia. Fast Track Asia is our new summer school that FASS started. Why did we start it? Because Asia is important. Right? And we want our students to have a chance to know, understand and appreciate Asia. So because of that, we started a summer school that centered on that and in the modules that they take, one of the modules, they will take two modules and one of them will take them out for a few trip, up to I believe 10 days we've worked it out. Right? So they will be under the charge of a lecturer and when they go on this field trip, it will be part of the curriculum. They will be doing a project. Okay? Um, so we think that that's a, it's a good compromise. Right? Not, you know, it's something that allows them to enjoy just two modules in six weeks, not, not too taxing, but at the same time, they're able to enrich themselves through an uh, on-site visit. Okay? So if, if you think that your, your child is interested, Fast Track has a booth that's near the lift in the S7 and the assistant dean in charge is there. Uh, we also run, you know, Odyssey, which is a similar kind of summer school compared to Fast Track. So over time, we expect that these two will merge. Right? We started Odyssey as a pilot for Fast Track, sort of, right? So last year, the students went to Thailand, I think. Um, and this year, one of my colleagues is taking a group to Laos. Right? So, you know, they go to the Asian hubs, right? Um, and you also can think about summer at Suzhou. Now, this is more serious. You spend six weeks in Suzhou because NUS uh, has a research centre there, the students stay there, and they will take two modules plus a lot of cultural, uh, a, a series of cultural programs. So this is a summer program, these are the summer programs that you know, our students can take advantage of in order to get to know Asia a little bit better. We have scholarships, I'm not going to spend too much time on it. Um, but for those of you who, for the, if your child has already received the scholarship, I congratulate you, it's, it's uh, very competitive right, because we have attracted many, many top students. Uh, so this is a benefit of an FASS scholarship. So some have asked, what if I didn't apply for this? You know, what other scholarships are available for me? Um, we have midstream scholarships as well. 
right? So these are things that will be, uh, I think, your student, your, the students will be alerted to them as the term progresses. And a lot of these scholarships are very generous, um, with, uh, are grown with very generous support from our alumni. So that's the beauty of FASS, right? Something that SMU does not have now because we've been around forever, for a long, long time. So because of that, people, you know, when you, when you look at alumni, right? Um, so I was staring at the CNM, you can look at afterwards. The CNM is ranked number four in the world. They're very good, they're a very good program. So they are showcasing their alumni on their wall. And, and all the alumni, because CNM is a fairly new major compared to the rest of us. So their alumni are still fairly junior right, in the hierarchy. You can see, you know, there are a lot of assistant directors and so forth. But if you look at FASS in general, FASS has been around for a long time. So our alumni, we have a whole generation of alumni who are now retired. So that's how far back we go. And alumni who have been established, who have, you know, done all good things and, you know, prepared the way for our graduates, they come back and they give back. They give back in more than one way. In addition to giving back through support like starting fellowships, scholarships and bursaries, they also give back in terms of time. So we have alumni who are mentors, alumni who will host our students. Um, so this is something that I think uh, that's, a, that's a benefit of coming to a, a faculty with a long tradition. University education sadly continues to be expensive. So we are mindful of that and we try to look after our students. So our principle is no student should be deprived of any of the opportunities that we have for them because of their financial standing. Right? So any time a student needs help and they feel that they are not able to take on the opportunities like going overseas because they don't want to tax parents, then we tell them to come to us because we have a series of you know, uh, opportunities, awards and bursaries to see them through it. So in addition to alumni mentorship, we also have good internships. Um, we are building up on career guidance uh, because we know that it's very important to teach our students how to jump. And they did, you know, SMU ad came out, right? Because uh, SMU was new at that time, so their ad, do you remember the ad? All the students were jumping in the air, they take picture of it, they put it on the buses, right? And I tell you, you know, at, at NUS we stare at these jumping ads and we go like, why? And we go like, no, 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 we have to think. We cannot be, you know, we cannot be so fuzzy daddy, right? We have to think what appeals to students. You know, jumping in the air is exciting for them. There's this whole idea of selling themselves, learning how to sell themselves. This is something that FASS students don't do enough of. Maybe they become like us and they come in here, they're modest, they feel, oh, we shouldn't be showing off, oh, we should be more, after all, we are humanities, and etc. Et then we go, no, 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 you've got to stop doing that. You've got to learn how to show off. Because if you don't show off, nobody would know how great we are. So we've, we've also decided to partner our students in that. So now they are no longer able to write this resume. This is first line is name, second line, NRIC, third line, driving license class. I look at that and I go like, who cares? And then they look at me like, oh, everybody says that. <laughs> so now we teach them how to write, how to manage interviews, how to dress for the occasion. Uh, so we have our own team doing that. So for parents, the most important question is, what can my child do with a Bachelor of Arts? So general. Ah, but the generalist is here to rule, right? Because now the problems are multidisciplinary. They cross so many sectors that if you are a specialist, you tend to be blindsided. So we always joke that, you know, engineer, we don't build bridges. That's tough, you know, working under the sun and all that. So engineer, let the engineers do that. But our kids will tell them where to build it, how to do assessment studies and boss them around. So this is the, you know, this, but every time when we talk about, you know, how do we showcase, perhaps the best way would be to show you where our graduates, you know, have gone, right? Uh, Kishore is one of the top global thinkers. He's named as one of the top global thinkers by foreign policy. He is a, the dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and he was a philosophy major in 1971. Professor Chan Hing Chi 
was the head of political science before she became a diplomat, and before that she graduated in political science in 1966. And she was a very long-standing ambassador to the United States, and we're very pleased to have her back with us, and now she sits you know, on our board of trustees. Dinah Sir, very pretty. Right? She met me by chance when, she, when her crew did an interview on the street, and then when, they, when she realized who I was, she came to see me, um, and she delivered a commencement speech last year. She's married to James Lai. So Diana, we can't claim James, but Diana is ours. She graduated to Japanese studies and math comm. So when she came and gave the commencement speech, I believe it was for the sociology session, everybody was taking pictures with them and I was left all by myself hosting all our guests. And I'm like, where's the dean? Isn't he taking pictures? <laughs> but Diana um, has done very well. Right? So has Fu Segment. Fu Segment was my student. He graduated in sociology in 1995 and went on to join CAAS, never left the company, and he runs Changi Airport. Right? So he was instrumental um, in the uh, formation of T3. And his wife is Adeline Fu, who is also our graduate, and she is the author of the Adrian Moore Children series. Right? Husband and wife team come back often to meet our, grad our students, to you know, uh, keep us informed of their progress and so forth. Now Janice Cole is the current NMP who looks after arts and Janice was a theatre studies major. So you see, if your child wants to go into theatre studies, it's alright. Don't discourage them. All right? There's a career waiting for them. So Janice, Janice um, um, has done very, very well as a theatre and television uh, uh, personality. Boon Hui, Tan Boon Hui was a geography major in 1992 and he's now director of Singapore Museums. Claire Chang, somebody I work with very regularly now, was a sociology major and she completed her master's with us as well. She's married to Ho Kwong Ping, who was also an arts graduate, right, and went on to do very successful things, including start our rival university. But that's all right. So Claire and Kong Ping are very proud members of the alumni. And Claire, of course, runs Banyan Tree. And we have Lim Sao Hong. Sao Hong is Chinese Studies and Sociology double major in 1982. And she is now Creative Director and CEO of 10AM Communications. We are here for you to explore, find out more, throughout the day, so please don't go home immediately. I believe the canteen is open, there are food stations everywhere. Make sure you get lots of freebies. Carry proudly our three bags. You notice that, don't just take blindly, okay? The, the bags represent the three divisions. Some will have all the social science, others will have all the Chinese studies, uh, the Asian studies, and yet others will have the humanities. Right? I, uh, who is in charge? So, I don't know what happened to all my admin people. I think there's a... Oh, I don't have a... I, yeah, there's no one struggling. No one here because this, this is reserved for parents. So I can take questions. If you don't have anywhere else to go, I can take questions. Please, go ahead. Yes, as long as they meet the requirements. I think like for Chinese, it has to be in Chinese language, right? Okay, so as long as they fulfill that, um, that's fine. And it, it doesn't, I mean, of course, if you're good in Chinese, then I would say try majoring in Chinese, okay? Because they are very, very good departments. But a lot of the students say, well, I'm good in Chinese, but I want to do other things as well. That's fine. They can fulfill the mother tongue requirements under unrestricted electives. Um, okay, we've been we've been uh, talking to our students about that. Okay, the question is whether we grade based on a bell curve, All right? Um, this is how we grade. Lecturers grade right because it's their students, and then we tell the lecturers you stand by your students. Okay, at the dean's office where I'm in charge, right? The departments, every department will stand up their curves. 
their marks, right? So by the time, all we look at is overall how is the department doing. We look at it for two, we look out for very roughly two things. The first is, because we are the dean's office, so we make sure that there's some kind of comparability, right? In other words, a student who majors in sociology should not be advantaged or disadvantaged compared to a student who majors in Malay studies, for example, right? I mean, that makes sense, isn't it? Because we, we cannot compare apples with oranges, but certainly there must be some level of comparability, right? So that you don't have what we worry about is students choosing a major or a module because they think it's easy, because the grader is easy. That's what we look out for, right? So we look out for comparability, okay? Then we also look out for, you know, fairness to students, for example, making sure that, you know, if a certain module has a cutoff for passing mark at this level, and it's way too high, you know, if you, for example, if you have earned 60% of the grade and you're still not passing the, the module, something is wrong, isn't it? So we look out for things like that, right? So this is what happens at the board, you know, at, uh, when we look at, at the at the deanery level. Then at the department level, they do the same. And now, they will be looking at each module. Again, same thing. Because we are all different. See, I, 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 I think I'm a fairly generous grader, maybe, compared to a colleague who is less generous. But a student should not suffer just because they chose my module and not a colleague's module. Right? So therefore, the department also has some standards that you should, if you, if, you know, an A should be this kind of quality, a B should be this kind of quality, but then we always tell colleagues, you stand by your students. If you feel that this group of students is very good, just write it down, and we defend it. If you still feel, feel that this group of students deserve to, to get the very low grades that you have given, then you better make sure you can stand by your statement because, you know, we will, we will support the colleagues. So that's how we moderate. But I think for all of us, and the students as well, we understand that there is some form of moderation that's required, right? Because, you see, if we don't go on a CAP system, right, then of course we don't, don't have to care. As long as you pass the module, it doesn't matter whether it's A, B, C, D, whatever, then in that case, not so, not so important to moderate. But because an A means something, a B means something, a C means something. And then because we have such a varied faculty, different disciplines with different expectations sometimes, right? In, in the quantitative module, you may have to be very good in stats and math and be able to come up. But in the qualitative module, it is the language skills, right? That you are getting, and that's very subjective sometimes, right? And, and I'll be the first one to admit that when you're grading an essay, you have to really pray for wisdom, that you do not get distracted. So because of all these, when we moderate, this is what we look out for, right? But if a student is good, a student is good. We will never de deprive a student of what they deserve. So, thank you so much. You're welcome. For some of the students, you can see at the top, whatever, five, ten, ten percent of the score. And sorry, and is this double the workload, you know, are they deprived of, you know, time or other activities? Yes, I'm glad you said it. Uh, for at NUS, our double degrees are real double degrees. They are not marketing gimmicks. And sadly, in other universities, not I'm not talking about the other universities in Singapore, but all over, right? Everybody offered, uh, this is the carrot that they dangle in advertisement. But if you look at the NUS double degree curriculum, if you are doing a DDP in economics and engineering, when you're done, you will be fully trained as an economist. And our econ department is very rigorous. Right? All the, if there's one department that has a lot of requirements, that's economics, okay? They're very rigid because they're very traditional in their training, very solid micro, macro, you know, theor theoretical, quantitative, and so forth. So you will be fully trained in economics and you will be an engineer. The double degree of law is the same. You will be a lawyer and you know, an economics uh, major. So, I don't think it is necessarily the option for every student. It requires serious overload. It will be very demanding. So therefore, unless a student is really passionate about this pursuit, I will not recommend it. But if they are passionate, 
the passion will drive them. So we see the double degree students all the time, those who make it, because the, there's also serious dropout, all right? They, we admit them now based on A-level scores, okay? A-level scores need not always predict. So a couple of our DDPs, JDPs, we do not allow a first year admission because we find that, come on, is anybody using this? No, right? No. Okay. Huh? Oh, you mean it's starting now, eh? Oh, oh. Yes, it's, it's two real double degree. Yes, it's demanding. By the time they stay on, they will have to complete, they will, they will have to be good. So therefore, they end up being, you know, the top few percent. But along the way, the not top few percent would have dropped off. I'm sorry, I have to give the sociology talk now, but I'm around after that. Um, please mingle, mingle, okay? And have a good day today. I'll see you tomorrow.